Hello, and welcome back to the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Meg Carney, and I'm an outdoor and environmental writer and author of the book, Outdoor Minimalist, Waste Less Hiking, Camping, and Backpacking. The Outdoor Minimalist Podcast has the goal to give listeners actionable ways to waste less hiking, camping, backpacking, and more during every step of their process. Your impact outdoors starts long before you hit the trail and goes beyond leave no trace ethics. You'll learn how to identify sustainable outdoor brands, how to ask hard questions regarding sustainability, and begin to shift and evolve your mindset to integrate minimalism into all of your outdoor pursuits. In episode 101 of the Outdoor Minimalist podcast, we get into the nitty gritty of wool production and answer the question, how sustainable and ethical is wool? Wool is a widely used natural fiber in the outdoor industry. Many of us probably have at least a few pairs of wool socks, maybe a wool sweater, wool base layers, and people have relied on wool materials to keep them warm and safe, even in the most extreme weather. As more of us gravitate away from synthetic materials, hopefully anyway, (laughs) and try to find more sustainable natural fibers that perform well, we might find ourselves preferring wool. But is wool always the best choice? You might be surprised by the answers brought forward by my guest today, Mike Summerby. Mike served as the marketing director of Duckworth for three years and was initially drawn to the company due to the intersectionality of performance fashion, sustainable supply chain and small footprint management, and Montana-based agriculture. A passionate outdoorsman, Mike has watched as brands operating under the guise of outdoor loving apparel manufacturers have plainly disregarded the environment and ecology of wild places and is dedicated to helping forge an example setting model for others to follow and iterate upon. Thanks for joining me today, Mike. I'm stoked to chat about all things wool, but before we get started into that topic, I do want to get to know you as a person a little bit better. So can you start by just telling me how you first became interested in outdoor recreation and how it currently fits into your life? Yeah, so I've actually had the um, the luck to live in many states in the United States. I've lived in California. I've lived in Connecticut. I've lived in Massachusetts, I've lived in New York, North Carolina, and finally now I live in Montana. And um, in those locations, all but New York City, I did have the opportunity to live adjacent to um, public land or adjacent to um, town land that allowed me as a child and as a young man to Um, in my free time, especially during the summers, just get out and explore. Um, It was definitely kind of a quintessential American childhood in that sense, um, where my neighbors and I would get together every morning and go to what we called Frog Pond um, and go look at the frogs and turtles and uh, and actually, you know, put ter- together some terrariums and whatnot, um, just always building forts out in the woods. And then I sort of started to refine um, the passion into what you might call more adult-like um, a- outdoor recreation, not always uh, netting frogs just for the fun of it. Um, was I um, started backpacking in the Adirondacks and um, ultimately when I was 18 did live about six weeks out in the Adirondacks three weeks on a week off and then three weeks on again and I think that really crystallized and solidified um, my love as someone who likes to spend uh, as much free time as possible outside Um, I did mention that I lived in New York City, which was honestly a mistake in retrospect. It's a great place. It just obviously wasn't going to fit for me, given what I just mentioned. And about a year and a half into living there after college, I made the um, decision quite quickly to go to a place that offered a much better work-life balance, as well as a better set of outdoor recreation opportunities and access and landed on Bozeman, just having grandparents that live about an hour and a half away from here. And my mom um, also spending a good portion of her life about an hour and a half away from Bozeman. So it always had been uh, a somewhat central place for my family to go and visit. And um, yeah, it's home now. That's awesome. That's quite the background. How did you end up working in the outdoor industry then? So you work for Duckworth now, which is like an outdoor apparel company. Mm -hmm. So was that something that you studied at university or how did you land that position? 
Yeah, so I was a journalism major, actually, and um, I did have journalism professors say that there was always the dark side, which was PR and marketing. Um, so you could say that I went over to the dark side there. Um, I'm sure they wouldn't really um, raise their noses too much at it. I think it was just kind of a tongue in cheek sort of joke in the journalism school, but it did provide me with um, plenty of opportunities to write and work in multimedia contexts. And through a series of jobs and internships, um, I did end up eventually working for a publication here in Montana. Uh, that was Mountain Outlaw Magazine writing for a local newspaper. Um, so it kind of reoriented my skills as a marketer to think and speak more in the parlance of being in a world of outdoors people. Um, and somewhere along the pandemic, I had a friend of mine, a good friend, um, connect me with the chairman of the board of Duckworth. And through that interaction, four months of interviewing, what have you, with the various players within the organization, I did transfer from that media position to the full-time marketing director for Duckworth. Awesome. Marketing is the dark side of every industry. So I don't, I don't disagree with your journalist. <laughs> <laughs> I also basically work in marketing, so I can't really say anything about that either. Right. And I've, I've, I've worked in darker corners of the dark side, you could say for clients where it does feel a little bit more like total BS mm. um, and emotional heartstring pulling, but we can get into that later about how Duckworth is different and how working with a sustainable textile is a bit different as well. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just transition into talking about Duckworth itself then. You mentioned your position is with marketing mm -hmm. um, and you can talk a little bit about what exactly you do for them, but also sure. um, what the brand is and what it stands for. All right, I might answer that backwards then. Um, what the brand is, is a uh, roughly 10-year-old, I would say, kind of straddling the lines of startup and more matured mid-sized business. Um, we are a merino wool apparel brand. Uh, we grow all of our wool here in Montana. Um, we have about 10,000 head of sheep about two hours from here over in Dillon, Montana. And that's sort of our ranching headquarters. Our operational headquarters are based in Bozeman, and we've just been iterating and innovating with our very own fleece now for that decade and have come up with a pretty solid set of products that have crystallized themselves as um, perennial favorites for people that are looking for um, a nice mix of affordability, performance, and then, of course, um, the two most fundamental pillars of our business, which are Montana Rocky Mountain grown and American made. And so in that, um, we do have a mission to help uplift the American agricultural industry. Um, we are an ag based business fundamentally. And then we also want to reinstill a, uh, if not a pride, but definitely a presence in USA made manufacturing. Um, growing up in New England, it is interesting now to work for a company working to um, fire back up the American made industry. Um, and that being, I, I lived in an area that had a ton of textile production historically and, um, countless towns throughout new England are just dilapidated and shells of themselves with plenty of, um, you know, economic and social issues as a result of tens of thousands of jobs, just kind of flooding out almost, a you know, in, in, in one person in one generation, um, lifetime. So, um, we're about trying to uh, bring those two pillars back um, and, and strengthen them, but also create products that are high performing and will get people out of Dodge, especially when they need them when they're out in the back country. Um, and what I do for them specifically, I'm the marketing director, so I do oversee just about every inch of the marketing. Um, and we're still a very small business, so my hands are definitely dirty in just about every piece of the equation you could think of. We do have a third-party agency that helps provide guidance as well as resources, depending on the project, um, especially if it fills a gap of my personal knowledge as a marketer or my personal technical expertise. But I do, day-to-day, um, -day, am very much hands-on, again, just about every piece. 
Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It is kind of fun to work for a smaller company sometimes because you get to see more sides of things and kind of have a, a say in more than just what you're doing all the time. Um, but it also Definitely. would be kind of um, a lot of work. I know that smaller companies, oftentimes you're wearing a lot of different hats. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I do want to talk a little bit about wool itself as a fabric, because it is a long standing and like traditionally used in the outdoor industry across mm -hmm. like a lot of different disciplines. Um, but since the rise of synthetics in the seventies, um, I feel like wool has been kind of pushed to the side in some respects. And it's kind of having like a a reemergence of popularity in the last like decade or so. So how do you think wool compares to other popular performance fabrics? It kind of depends on where you are and what you need it for. We do make a product line for just about everything from, you know, north of 110 degree heat. I actually spent two weeks um, in conditions like that in a desert last late summer and wore one of our vapor hoodies for that entire time um the same exact vapor hoodie actually um and then we have gear that is designed to help maintain your uh, body temperature and condition that could be all the way down to minus 40 or below if you read some of our reviews we do have casual wearers or i'd say maybe amateur backcountry athletes um but we do have people that are saying that this was what I packed for my expedition to Antarctica. This is what I packed for expedition to Alaska. I used this my entire time in the Mojave Desert, et cetera, et cetera. So we do um, see that people are finding differing use cases and justifying the use of wool in each of those use cases. Uh, one area where wool could probably never compare um, is in the context of maybe like a rain slicker or a type of... Um, winter shell that you might wear skiing we do have a fabric that you could pour a glass of water over and it will pretty much just slick off but with prolonged exposure it eventually would probably start to take on a little of the water whereas the the rubber um, and plastic within a plastic shell would never really do that unless it's really worn down and has lost some of that coating and protectiveness um but the reason I think that people didn't want to have wool for a long time, especially when synthetics proposed another option, is that people had traditionally understood wool to be a very itchy and uncomfortable textile to have against the skin. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a trope to have grandma's sweater that she knitted for you, and it's just incredibly uncomfortable on the torso and on the arms. And one of the things that has happened is that genetics has um genetics in conjunction with new technologies have allowed wool producers to be more selective and then more selective with their end product that the wool ends up going into um we are pretty unique in the sense that we test every single one of our fleece um shorn fleeces for uh, micron diameter as well as um, what we call comfort factor, which is the percentage of um, fibers that are under a certain micron. Um, and we then, you know, make sure that those genetics not only are carried forward into the next iteration of sheep born at the ranch, but then make sure based on that micron diameter, we're picking a um, use case that makes sense. So for example, coarser fibers, coarser textiles, are going to be on places like the feet that are generally less sensitive than the torso and arms um, or the top of the head. So we can kind of back in based on that specific fleece's characteristics into a product that makes sense where people wouldn't perceive things like micron diameter. Whereas in the past, and a lot of wool producers still do this, is that they just aggregate all the fleeces into one bin. So you might have some really fine fleece, you might have some really coarse fleece, and then when you actually end up having that sweater or whatever the end product is and it feels itchy, it's those coarse, fle uh, coarse fibers poking through and irritating your skin um, and making it feel generally uncomfortable. So that's why I think suddenly wool has um, reemerged as, well, at least one of the reasons it's reemerged as a um, favored textile for outdoor enthusiasts is because it's becoming a lot more comfortable and that's due in part to tech and again, genetics. 
Um, the second piece, though, is the sustainability factor. And I know you have some subsequent questions that are probably going to relate to how does will insert itself into this really important and pressing question of producing clothing that is truly bona fide sustainable. Um, so maybe I'll just kind of leave that there or we could kind of, you know, move forward on that. You just let me know. Um, I could I could keep going on that train. Um, I think we'll I do also kind of want to talk about wool in like more general terms before we kind of like jump into the more specific like environmental impacts and sustainability. So okay. if you don't mind kind of like pivoting to maybe some of the like specific performance benefits of wool if you're using okay. it in a backcountry setting. Sure. Sure. Yeah, so some of the benefits that are um, most notable and, and well known, um, there's an odor free quality uh, bacteria just doesn't bind to the fiber the same way. So we grow as humans a keratin based fiber and sheep's wool is actually a protein based fiber so it behaves differently than what we think of as hair it's not really a fair comparison to think of it as hair. And with that being a protein fiber and being an evolutionary characteristic of sheep which originated in a desert climate, which would have meant that they'd need to withstand very hot days and very cold nights, um, is just a number of thermoregulation property, properties that are totally unique to this type of fiber. It's kind of like their superpower to be able to just hang out in an environment that's capable of swinging so dramatically from below freezing to, you know, um, potentially lethal temperatures for lots of other species during the day. Um, so that thermo thermoregulation is a, is a big one. Another one is that if wool gets wet, um, it actually on an atomic level starts undergoing a reaction, which creates a warming sensation. So when you have on a war warm, uh, a wool garment and it starts to get damp out or you start to get rained on, Yes, you will feel the sensation of being wet, but it will actually maintain warmth in a much better way than, for example, a cotton t-shirt um, or a cotton layer or even some synthetic layers. Um, it just it can be life or death for, you know, if someone's out there and they're, they're sweating and their um, and their gear becomes soaked or it rains and then it draws the body temperature out of the person itself, it can definitely be a life threatening situation. So I think that's definitely probably the biggest is that thermoregulation property, the the quick moisture wicking property, as well as maintaining that warmth, even when wet. Um, it can definitely be a game changer. I mean, you wouldn't want to go multiple days with a wet garment on. But given that wool does dry pretty quickly and and wicks moisture very effectively, that usually wouldn't be the case unless you were in prolonged downpour snowfall and just really couldn't get any cover but all the same it does have that benefit of of getting warmer when wet um so i think that those are probably some of the biggest ones um people do have um for example if they're wildland firefighters do like wool layers ironically you would think they would want to have something as cool as possible wool can be cooling depending on how it's formed into a fabric but it's also um a fire retardant um, and so it can definitely keep to a certain extent flames from, you know, burning your clothes apart or, um, worse singeing you. Um, so that's a very unique little use case. Um, and it's durable compared to, um, synthetics and cottons. If you bend those fibers back and forth repeatedly, uh, if you can try to imagine for a sec, you know, getting a giant wool fiber compared to a giant synthetic poly fiber or cotton fiber and just literally bending it back and forth. Um, the poly and the cotton will actually snap at an earlier iteration than the wool. So you do have a durability factor there as well. That's really interesting because I feel like a lot of times the synthetics are like, that's like a something that they say a lot in their marketing is like they use the synthetic because of the high level of durability mm -hmm. um, for that um, fiber. And so it's interesting to hear about wool and how it well, compares. I suppose that's accurate. For example, if they were making a very dense GSM type of construction, or for example, if they're taking, like we were talking earlier about the ski shell or the rain jacket, 
and it's one single coat that's almost been melted and formed into place. Um, that, that might be true. Um, but when you're talking about another benefit of wool is that it's very lightweight. Um, and if you are a pound counter or you're going on a through hike and you're really making sure that your ounces, um, every ounce is truly counted before you get the pack on so that you can maintain your energy, um, comparing a synthetic GSM layer to a wool gsm layer or just sheer weight is um you know wool is going to outperform in the durability factor okay yeah that makes sense mm -hmm. and you mentioned um a little bit earlier when you were explaining duckworth as a company you talked a little bit about some production aspects but i'd love to know more about wool production in general and so could you explain kind of how wool is traditionally produced and then if Duckworth produces it in a different way or a more sustainable way, um, you can talk mm -hmm. about that as well. Yeah, I think it's pretty hard to actually unmarry sustainability from the way that we do raise our sheep. Um, we are, so as I mentioned earlier, we have about 10,000 head of sheep. They're not in one singular mass. They're actually separated into bands of about 2,000. So any given year, four to five bands of sheep that are separated often by at least a mile um, wherever they're grazing. Um, but we do operate on a hundred thousand acres, more or less of a public private land mixture. Um, the, the public land is leased from the forest service. And what we do that is different, for example, from maybe, and I don't want this to sound like a degradation of sheep producers, generally speaking, it's just hard to it's hard to achieve this in a place that's not um, open and, and quite wild like Montana is or Wyoming or Idaho or any of the Western mountain states in a lot of ways is um, traditionally speaking, you might think of a couple thousand sheep in a pen, maybe move pen to pen. Um, they're maybe moved into a barn at certain points of the year. Um, they just, the, the land at that point becomes artificial because you have such a high density of animals grazing it stomping on it um just interfacing with the land in a much more concentrated manner that never actually allows the 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 land usually to recover properly it doesn't really look like how it would naturally you know sheep would you know certainly move on from a patch of dirt overturned dirt in a in a pen type environment that you might find if they were out in the wild they would go look for for natural forage and an abundance of it. Um, so you're just you're just looking at a landscape that really isn't cultivated um, or or nurtured in a way that um, is truly sustainable. And again, this is just the benefit of having access to so much land. Our sheep are consistently moved across 100,000 acres. So you can imagine that um, there are pieces of that acreage that might never have a sheep physically stand on it, let alone graze it for decades. I mean, it's just impossible to, that, that amount of land is, is hard to really wrap your head around. I mean, we do move our sheep every summer and fall in what we call sheep trail down from the prairie up into the mountains during the summertime, um, just where there's a lot more green pasture and it's a lot more lush, more water. Of course, we bring them down in the winter and fall so that we can have easier access to them and, and give them hay. There's also a lot less snow, which is, um, you know, inherently less dangerous for them. Um, but in that in that sense, they're 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 at, they're operating like a natural herd ungulate might, um, which is to say that it's just constantly moving with the forage, and it's you know re releasing uh, manure for the landscape. It's keeping shrubs and trees at bay so that the prairie maintains its consistency as a grassland ecology. Um, but for a sense of scope, it takes us about six to seven days per band to move them from their winter pasture to their final summer pasture, sometimes upwards of 10 days. So it's a lot of land to cover. And that's that's putting in, you know, 12 to 16 hour days of, of movement per day. So it's it's a vast amount of territory for them to inhabit. Um, and in that, again, I mean, there's there's patches of of grant of grass. Um, and prairie that haven't had a sheep actually graze it in literally perhaps decades. Um, and it's all the same operation. So that's that's incredible. And that would definitely be what would fall under the umbrella of regenerative 
active agriculture, that management treating the livestock as if it was a natural occurring wild entity. Um, and, you know, we've seen the success for our rangeland as well. We've seen um, certain plant ecology come back that wasn't there. And we've worked um, hand in hand with the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service to achieve certain results. We've seen, um, you know, higher numbers of, for example, sage grouse, which is an endangered um, bird um, appearing in more frequency. Um, and it just, I mean, everything spirals out from a couple of keystone species, right? It's it's really important to nurture some of the most vulnerable pieces of an ecology um, because their impacts on the rest of the species inhabiting that area are are sometimes hard to measure or understand until you can see it regaining steam in the right direction. Um, so our management style is definitely very, very unique. Um, in the state of Montana, it was a lot more common to have free ranging herds of sheep in the way that we um, do in the way that I just described. Um, it's become less common um, for a number of reasons, but it's uh, it, it's just definitely a way to do it that that helps the land actually versus hurt it. And then every year, every spring, starting in about March, we start shearing the sheep. Um, and so it's kind of like getting a haircut with a buzz, you know, buzz cut clippers. You you bring the sheep in a couple hundred at a time, shear them. We test every single fleece under, um, I never get the full name right. It's like the optical fiber diameter analyzer. Um, something, it sounds really techy, but it's this sort of machine in a suitcase that has a uh, microscope on it and runs a piece of every single clip underneath. And then we can say, that's triple A wool, that's double A wool, that's single A wool. Let's not only make sure that we know that that sheep is producing a super high quality wool, but again, let's dictate what the end product is from that specific um, fleece and other fleeces like it that we bunch together in bundles. Yeah, that's a pretty extensive operation. Mm -hmm. And it's it sounds like the way that you described it at the beginning, it's much different than how maybe wool is produced more commonly, like in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that the model that Duckworth have would be like scalable to meet the demand of wool? <laughs> yeah, so I, it's it's worth mentioning just a little extra background here about the company. The company is founded by now fourth generation Montana sheep ranchers. And it was founded uh, by a man named John Helly and another man named Bernie Bernthal. And so John grew up sheep ranching on the very same ranch out in Dillon, Montana, and essentially was kind of peeved by a phenomenon that he was seeing that raising sheep in Montana is a lot bigger and different of a beast than raising sheep in, say, Connecticut. Um, there's just a whole host of factors that are completely different and they're definitely more extreme. As someone from Connecticut, there's no grizzly bears, there's no minus 40 winters, there's no mountains to hurdle. Um, everything's very connected by highway. I mean, it's just there's, it's just a night and day different situation. Um, but he was getting frustrated saying, we put in all this extra work by, you know, it's the very nature of the beast that we have to. And we're still getting kind of roped into this generalized commodities market for wool. So why are we, what's, what's it worth at that point, right? Like, what's the point? We're, 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 we're breaking our backs here to get the same price as everyone else. So he goes off to MSU and gets a degree in animal sciences, came back and really began enhancing the genetics of the, of the sheep themselves. And that's not to say we're like sitting there with syringes and being like, let's make mutant cyborg sheep here. That, that's not the enhancements that I'm talking about. It's really just making sure that the finest Merino strongest sheep are bred to then create the next batch of livestock that are able to carry on those traits generation to generation. Um, this really set the stage, though, for when a player like Bernie Bernthal, who's a serial entrepreneur and a serial brand starter, starter, came to John Helly and said, you reputably have some of the finest wool in the world and that's true whatever duckworth does with the wool is one thing the, the wool that john helly and his family grow at the ranch is incredible um for a number of reasons the degree of crimp the loft all these different factors that just make it an outstanding product um 
But so Bernie says, you have this really outstanding wool. Let's essentially untether you from that commodities market, create a clothing line with your very own wool. That way you can almost kind of back into a price to set for your own work. And you have, you know, two eggs in the basket that is you're producing the wool and you're selling the end product. Um, so you're starting to bookend the supply chain and owning those two stages allows you to dictate a lot of a lot more what's happening in the middle. Um, bringing that back to your question, is this scalable? Um, our roots as a typical ranch or rather an atypical ranch, but a ranch nonetheless, um, you know, normal ranching operations happen there, including the selling of genetics. People will pay top dollar to have um, a ram come to their operation or a couple rams come to their operation so that they can then have their ewes or their lambs eventually start having some of that really high quality fine wool. Um, so with that being said, um, bringing that in connection to one of our pillars of uplifting American ag in many respects is, you know, we are actively building a collective, a co-op, you could call it, of individuals and ranches that are producing top-notch wool and for the most part they have our genetics there so we can really start to lean into that as something it's already been proprietary but we can really start to lean into that as a scalable proprietary nature of our business okay awesome yeah no that's very cool that's very um i can't think of the word right now so i'm just going to move on um okay so <laughs> It's interesting to hear about um, that the rancher himself is kind of like the founder in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, because I feel like in a lot of brands and companies, it's very far removed from like the actual production of the fabric and the end product. But the fact that he would kind of um, be integrated into all the stages, I think, is important to note. Um but if we're looking at wool production in general, and it's okay if you don't like have a lot of information on the broad scope of like the global wool production, but mm -hmm. I feel like of anyone you might, um, do you think that wool as a fabric um, has a more positive or negative environmental impact? I think on the aggregate, it's, it's a hard question to answer because there's a lot of players involved on the global scale. Uh, American wool already represents a very small sliver of the general wool production in the world um, in totality. Um, but, you know, our operation is a sliver of that small sliver. Um, it's kind of like anything else, right? So cotton is a 100% organic material. You grow it from the soil. But if you have you know, whole swaths of towns, if not counties that are dedicated to a monoculture, um, you're going to have some problems, right? There's the, even if you're using the most organic non-GMO seeds ever, and you're planting it seed by seed by seed, but you take up 80% of a county in Georgia with cotton, I mean, bees are certainly going to suffer, which is going to make birds suffer, which is going to make, you know, everything is going to cascade from that monoculture nature of how it is produced. So the the really hard thing for me is that um, you can find a downside of just about any single textile that is organically um, derived. Um, that is to say, not synthetic. Um, it's just trying to encourage not only the consumer to understand what those negative downsides are, but also just to value them. Um, you know, we we really shouldn't be supporting GMO massive monoculture operations, and we shouldn't be supporting wool producers that are just getting their fleece from, you know, God knows where across, you know, multiple continents blended into one. We don't know how those animals are treated. We don't know how those human beings that raise the animals are treated. It's hard work and it's not always the most desirable work. And so, you know, I don't I can't speak for another country like perhaps Turkey or Uruguay or China or or even Australia. I don't know what it's like to be a wool producer there or at least to be a grunt within a wool producing operation. And again, I don't know what those people do to the animals. Um, I can certainly say that. Um, 
it's unique to find an operation that is stewarding the land actively in the way that we do. I mean, it's a family operation. We can't just pack up and find another plot of land. We need this piece of land to keep producing for generations so that the helis can feel comfortable passing it down generation to generation. It doesn't just become a massive tax burden because you're just sitting on a giant piece of dead land. Um, and I mean, just for the sake of the beauty of the ecology as well, I mean, Montana is not very hard on the eyes and anyone that grows up here, certainly that it's just in your blood to appreciate that. But, you know, it's, it's a hard question to ask um, or to answer rather. I, I think that there's on the aggregate, the wool industry certainly has its problems. Um, it definitely can, you know, depending on where it's dyed, for example, if it's dyed in a country that doesn't have regulations about dumping the wastewater into a river i mean that's a huge problem if it's cut and sewn in a country that doesn't value human rights and there's someone to replace you at the manufacturing stage every single day that's also a problem um if the sheep are you know there was a video that came out of a PETA, a, a PETA video um from a sheep ranching operation in south america that was actually headed up by um uh patagonia and i think patagonia has since severed ties with this operation um, but it just goes to show that even the best you know companies that really put their money where their mouth is can make mistakes with this textile i mean the sheep were in, were were treated totally inhumanely it's actually really kind of disturbing to see some of the practices that were employed in in raising those sheep um you know are they, they some of them may have never even seen the light of day and just kind of lived in their own filth doing whatever until the day that they were killed for 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 meat and then had you know shorn i don't i mean it's just it was it was awful and um that's why raising sheep in a country or a culture that does value things like workers rights human rights animal rights environmental rights and this isn't necessarily true across the United States. I'm not saying the United States is the perfect picture of, of health in every single one of those categories, um, but it's certainly a leg up from some of the more traditional international textile manufacturing hubs of the world. Um, and so we have to put emphasis on consumer understanding those differences, but also caring about those, under, th those differences because um, ultimately the market is going to go where the consumer dollar is it's it's the truth um if consumers all started buying electric cars tomorrow and every single person replaced their car with an electric car tomorrow there probably would be a massive drop in prospective new gas um you know drilling right it just would be automatic it just would wouldn't make sense anymore so companies that would see that their consumers really care about all of those stages of the operation in the context of wool are going to start doing things differently. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up the um, the ethics of producing wool as well on the human and animal side. And so yeah. that brings me to a question that has come up a lot in my life because I am vegan is mm -hmm. can wool production be ethical? And that's mostly coming from a place of like, if you are a quote unquote ethical vegan, you don't use anything that comes from an animal. So that includes like down, wool, even honey. Um, and so a lot of times they will gravitate towards um, a synthetic instead of wool when like mm -hmm. there's a lot of pros and cons to that mindset in general. Um, so it'd just be interesting to hear your perspective on the ethics and if there are any vegans listening, maybe you could speak to them. I'm going to speak to my vegans out there. But so um, this this might come across a little a little uh, misanthropic, I might say. Um, the truth of the matter is people aren't meant to live in anything that isn't necessarily an equatorial environment. That is what we are designed to survive in. Um, all of our features with some you know, regional disparities and obviously, you know, populations living in the Andes can process oxygen with more efficient. So these sorts of genetic changes that happened on a smaller scale, but we are really an equatorial population when it comes to surviving in how nature made us, which is completely naked. 
Um, and with that being said, most of us live in places that are temperate or people live in places that are actually quite cold at certain times of the years and you will not survive if you do not have clothing. And so with that being said, I think it's a very hard question to answer because let's just say you're looking at synthetics. Well, synthetics we know comes from oil. And what, where do we get oil? We get oil from places like Alaska, where we disrupt fisheries and we, um, you know, spawning zones and we, you know, take away landscape from everything that survives off that spawning zone, like bears and wolves and this and that. And um, we, we, we log so that we can get better access to these places. So I think, um, and then not to mention, you have your 100% synthetic poly piece of performance wear and you throw it in the washing machine and it creates microplastics and we know this and then where do the microplastics end up they end up in the you know fisheries and birds and and everything else i mean they're ending up in our own bellies we're finding them there and not to say that i'm trying to put importance on humans preeminently here in this discussion but um you know we are impacting animals in ways that we cannot see um, when we when we work with synthetics. And I don't know how we quantify those impacts to those animals. I don't know how we, I mean, might one day we might be able to look at it holistically and hopefully it's not because we've realized we really screwed the pooch, um, but we'll look at it from every angle here and say, wow, okay, this really was a bigger problem than we thought it was even then. Or really, it wasn't that much problem at all. I happen to think that having chunks of plastic to the tune of a credit card a, a month in your body is probably not the best thing. And that is true of every pretty pretty much every creature that that eats at this point um, is going to have microplastics inside of them. Um, and so, you know, if we look at a sheep ranching operation, is that sheep living like this bountiful sheep that would is living naturally in some you know middle eastern desert mountainous terrain no um but generally speaking those animals are treated at least at our operation are treated very fairly and well they're i mean the 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 labor that goes into keeping them alive in a place like montana especially during the winter um when they're really dependent on people would really illustrate that we're i mean the, the product they have is invaluable to us, but there's a great effort going into making sure that they have a high quality of life as creatures. Um, and so, yes, they get a haircut every year. Um, they might get a, you know, a razor neck here or there. I get those when I shave my face and then they're released back out to go munch some grasses and run around the mountains. And the worst thing that could happen to them is a grizzly bear or a mountain lion gets them. And that's completely natural. Um, if you're a deer, the same thing's happening to you. So, um, it's kind of a, it's a really, it's a tough one because the scales are kind of hard to quantify. Um, I, pers I personally would like knowing that I'd, I'd like to know distinctly what happens to the animal versus, you know, the devil, you know, I suppose, and I don't really think of it as the, as the devil anyway. I think, you know, again, the animals are treated very humanely, um, at least on our operation, but it's the devil, you know, I don't want to know that, you know, my pile of synthetic gear contributed in some tangential way to the proliferation of uh, an industry that, whether directly or indirectly hurt natural life. And maybe on a greater scale maybe to the tunes of millions of beings versus just 10,000. And I, and again, it comes back to how we have a lot of people, we have to clothe them and it's kind of, what do we pick? What do we do? What do we pick here? Yeah. I feel like a lot of times it with textiles specifically, I have kind of gotten down to what is the lesser of the two evils here? <laughs> and that's not always like the best outlook, but sometimes I think mm -hmm. it's the best way to make uh, an educated decision. Um, and one that aligns with your values, because I think for me as a vegan, I used to be in the train, like I was very specific. I was like, no, basically no to all animal products all of the time. And then as like I learned more, 
about the environmental impact of all these different industries. It was more of a, okay, what areas allow me to minimize the most harm? And that's kind of what I'm hearing from you is like, Duckworth's production is minimizing harm in a lot of different areas. But if you're buying from just some random company that is selling wool that you know nothing of the origins from, I would I wouldn't buy from someone like that. Um, just because yeah. I wouldn't buy from someone like that to buy anything for synthetic either, because I know nothing of the production quality or the model. Um, so I don't know. It is definitely a hard question because there's a lot of um, unethical production practices in every industry. <laughs> yeah, and, and probably, probably to be honest with you, the most if we were to really do with with people clothe people in the most ethical way possible, and maybe the vegans don't like this, <laughs> is that you know, once a year someone goes out and shoots an animal skins it prepares its skin and you make your own clothing out of that as well as use the bones skin you know every single piece of that animal to clothe yourself in one set of clothing per year i mean that's just what as our as our species evolved to move out of that equatorial zone that did still have a sense of harmony in many instances that um or if you want raise your own sheep shear them and 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 give them the most love you possibly could and and understand them on a super intimate level and again make your own clothing um because i think if you think about it in terms of every stage of what happens with synthetics if you think about it with with any clothing it doesn't matter if it's tensile if it's modal if it's uh hemp i mean there's always some sort of form of industrial processing that might impact animals and again we are very transparent with what happens in our processing, especially starting with the animals themselves. And hopefully people can feel comfortable understanding and knowing that they have a good grasp on that um, when they shop our clothing. Yeah, I think transparency is key when you're looking at companies. And that's one of the main things that I look for is just how transparent they are about the entire production model. And mm -hmm. so what advice would you give consumers if they're interested in buying wool products and they want to make sure that they are aligning them both ethically and sustainably? Yeah, I would say, and this is, I mean, everything I'm going to say sounds like a plug for <laughs> Duckworth. So just bear with me, everyone. But uh, the, the truth is, um, the smaller the footprint, the smaller the supply chain, that's the best way to go. Um, as long as the processing within that that supply chain is sound and done ethically or as ethically as possible, that's the best way to go. So if you live in, I don't know, if you live in Guatemala or if you live in Brazil and there's a company that's shearing the wool and making the wool clothing right there in Brazil, that's your best bet. Simply put, you just remove 10, 000, tens of thousands of miles worth of emissions from the supply chain. You're removing the possibility for, um, for abuse to happen and go unnoticed because the chain is so um, distant. Every single leg of it is just so dehumanized or decoupled from the animal welfare because, you know, your sheep wool growers in Uruguay and your spinning is in vietnam and then your fabric manufacturing is in china and you're wholesaling out of germany and australia i mean it just you just you lose the ability to be truly accountable and i know a lot of companies do a lot of really good things that are still using massive supply chains or at least multiple leg multiple continent supply chains you know they're looking for certifications in terms of workplace compliance they're looking for certifications in terms of animal husbandry but they're just not there they're not there and that's the truth unless they're going you know every month at random the same way a health inspector does to a restaurant to to make sure that things are actually being done properly and it's not just lip service or just you know they were ready and waiting for you then that's just how it's going to be i mean you have you have to have someone there that's honestly taking a look under the hood at random and making sure that it's day to day these qualities of the supply chain are consistent and it's not a singular moment or a singular visit um and so that's that's a big piece of it is i think small and in intimately managed supply chains um one of the things i love about usa made and um 
people can interpret USA made in so many different ways and they can market it in so many different ways. There's definitely a nationalistic bent to some marketing of USA made. Um, it's kind of like a screw everyone else type of situation. Um, and you see that with certain brands for sure. Um, that's not how we do it. We list the multiple properties of having a USA made. We can control how the land is treated and how the animals are treated. We can control and evaluate how humans are treated amongst this journey, even at manufacturing facilities that are partners and aren't inherently owned by us. And we can then shave tens of thousands of miles off of the supply chain, again, um, from having such a smaller scale supply chain. And, um, and lastly, we can support communities. We can make sure, again, that worker, worker conditions are great, and we can, we can help revitalize places that were totally killed off when we moved our manufacturing overseas so that we could save money. Yeah, those are all really great points. And I am always a fan of localizing systems. I think that that is a great approach to things, especially in recent years when we had so many supply chain interruptions, it became really obvious the need for um, a more local um, supply chain in general. So we, thank we, you. Oh, go ahead. I might just I might just add one thing too. Is we're, we're actually very similarly priced to our competitors mm. and best case scenario they're getting maybe five to 10% more margin than we are because of the cheapness of the labor and cheapness of the system in comparison to an American made system. American made just is expensive for things like minimum wage and workplace safety and caps on hours and what have you. Um, that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario is they're doing all that and getting, you know, 50% more margin than we are, or, you know, really, really, because we're priced almost identically to our competitors. So the point that I'm trying to make is either they're ripping us off um, or why not just move here if it's only a five to 10% difference and you can get all this net environmental benefit? Why not? I mean, five to 10%, I mean, is it really worth it? That's a great question that I think people will have to answer on their own. Um, mm -hmm. So how can listeners learn more about Duckworth and check out any of the resources you may have or even maybe read your sustainability report? Yeah, so we feature our supply chain right on our website. Um, you can just search it right there in the search bar. There might also, it's under the top head, header. I think there's a little tab that says our wool or an about, um, sorry for blanking on that, but you can find our sustainability and ethics pledges and story right there. Um, and that website is www.duckworthco.com. Uh, Duckworth Co, so D-U-C-K-W-O-R-T-H-C-O.com. And our social media for the most part, Instagram and Facebook being the two most uh, predominant ones, um, is just at Duckworth Co. So you can check us out there if you want, maybe a little bit more of a um, less salesy bent and more just visually driven. It's really neat. I mean, we work with some really interesting people out here in the landscape photography and lifestyle photography is beautiful. So you can check us out there, but um, yeah. And I'll be sure to share the links to all that in the show notes. So if people want to check it out, they can just jump down there. Um, but with that thank you for sharing all those wonderful insights and giving us kind of a deep dive into duckworth's production of course it was my pleasure and I'm, I'm really this was a fun conversation i'm glad that we were able to have it thanks for listening and if you like what you hear let me know leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode you can find us on instagram at outdoor.minimalist.book on YouTube, or subscribe to our weekly newsletter at theoutdoorminimalist.com. For even more updates, other educational resources, and to help build an outdoor community with the shared goal to create a better outdoor space as we recreate.